So in my division's name, we also have physical activity, so everybody should stand up and just wiggle around a little bit and reach for the sky and turn sideways and turn this way. Yay, everybody. All right, thank you. It is truly an honor to be here um, and participate in this. Although this is the 10th summit, it's only my second summit. So I just continue to learn so much from everyone as I listen to this. And 10 years, what an accomplishment. As I get older, those 10 year decades somehow become even more meaningful because all of a sudden you don't have like five more of them coming down the track. So I just wanna applaud everybody who's been part of this movement from the beginning and all the stories that we've heard from many of the speakers how breastfeeding has just been a part of their culture internally and they're bringing that to this effort. And I wanna talk about CDC's perspective and talk about what we've done the last decade. And I also wanna talk about how we hope to continue the momentum with everybody in the room and that we are in this with all of you together. I wish I had thought, Karen did a great job of telling a story about herself and I was sitting there thinking that, man, I should have thought of a great story to tell my, about myself because it is more entertaining because you don't really know who I am, but I couldn't think of a great one. So I hope by the end I will think of a great story. But first where I want to start is at last year's meeting, we had the privilege of having the Surgeon General Jerome, Jerome Adams speak. And Jerome is, as you all know, a great advocate for breastfeeding, very articulate, and we depend on his vision now as he is Surgeon General. And I just wanted everybody to really see this quote that came out from Jerome. And, and it is, I think, critical that the key words he has in there about taking action to support breastfeeding. And that's what CDC wants to do. And we wanna to continue to support this vision. Even if Jerome isn't the Surgeon General over the next 10 years, we wanna to continue to do this work as well. Everybody's talked about this too, so I'm gonna skip um, a lot of this information, but what I wanna talk to you about, and you all know this, breastfeeding is an investment in health, not only for babies, but for moms. And from our perspective at CDC, again, I mentioned in my question, that stage of birth to 24 months is terrifying for so many parents because they don't understand what to do and when I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in that area. But almost no one in our communities understands that breastfeeding benefits the mothers. So you guys all know that because you read the papers and you read the research and you're smart people. But when you talk to people in communities, we're lucky enough to have the racial and ethnic approaches to community health projects in my division. And we talk about this from our project officers to incorporate into some of the work that they're doing in the local level. And people don't know this. People have no idea that breastfeeding protects the moms from hypertension, from type two diabetes, from ovarian cancer, from breast cancer. So I just, I just wanna say that, that we've made a lot of progress, we. You guys have made a lot of progress with the science and moving this field forward so that we can now talk about that more. So thank you for that. So there's so much progress to celebrate. Today I wanna to talk about breastfeeding rates and as we've mentioned in other speakers, I'll be brief, continue to go up. Support for breastfeeding is growing and certainly national partnerships and initiatives continue to show progress. I think one of the greatest and most exciting changes over the last decade and people have mentioned the baby friendly hospitals certainly over some of the earlier presentations is we just have so many more births occurring in hospitals that support breastfeeding and we will have a milestone this year. We will have one million babies born in a baby-friendly hospital each year. As of Monday, we were at 995,250 births in the United States in this calendar year. So we just have 4,750 babies to go since Monday, and we will reach this milestone. And we will be able to all walk around and say that at least a million babies per year in the United States are born in baby-friendly hospitals. You see the 10-year trajectory here on the number, on the percentage of babies that are born in baby-friendly hospitals and facilities. And that's a pretty impressive jump, 3% to 24%. What's really impressive is the 500 baby-friendly hospitals are in every country in the United States now, and in DC and in Puerto Rico. So we're really excited about that movement. If you look back at the 10 years of data, and again, many people have shown this, 
we continue to have an increase in the percent of U.S. children who were breastfed. So this is really important, and we're looking forward to continuing on that. Really um, exciting, too, is the duration and exclusivity have increased overall. Now, yes, there's room for improvement, and we're going to talk about that part at the end, but we all have to pause every once in a while and give ourselves credit for improvements. So what this means, we now are at 25% of children who actually are <laughs> getting the guidelines applied to them, basically. So ACOG and AAP have come out with this guideline, and we thank you for that because it moves the whole field forward. Now we're showing, able to show that one in four kids in the United States are actually receiving care that are consistent with these guidelines. And, and I love the slide earlier, not every woman getting, the, you know, meeting the recommendations from the guidelines. That is the negative frame to this point. But the positive frame is look at how much success we've had in the last 10 years to go from 14% to 25%. We've softened the ground with so many maternity care practice and birth facilities that we can continue to make progress. And we have the powerhouses of ACOG and AAP coming out with these recommendations so people have them as a bar to look towards. So I want to talk about Healthy People 2020 objectives a little bit. We've made great progress as this slide shows. So what you see here is that every, where there's a check, we've met the guideline for 2020. And everywhere we have a circle, we still have some room to go. But it's not 2020 yet, so let's not panic. But I want to talk a little bit about where these things come from, where these objectives come from. And I don't know how many of you have been involved with actually coming up with the 2020, with the Healthy People objectives. We are currently working on the 2030 objectives, and we've been asked by the administration to cut them by at least a half and maybe even two-thirds, which you could obviously frame that as a negative thing, but I'm sorry, how many of you have seen the printed copies of the Healthy People 2020 objectives? You know, they're like this tall. They're ridiculous. I'm sorry. So the new rules are you can't have an objective unless you can show a baseline and then have two measurements during the 10-year period. It's actually a really reasonable thing because what we did in 2020 is we added a lot of variables that we were dreaming about. Wouldn't it be nice if we could show social determinants of health? Let's put in a baseline unknown and guess what the 2020 objective might be. So all that to say that we're really proud of these 2020 objectives for breastfeeding and we are hoping that they are not going to get d diminished. But what you see, and, and let me really point this out, is that the, the, health, the maternal, infant, and child health Number 21, increase the proportion of infants who are breastfed. So we're making progress, but look, there's five subcategories. So that's a lot of data to track, and you need a lot of resources to track that data. So if you couldn't have all five of them, which one would be the most important? Those are the kind of discussions that people spend hours and hours and hours discussing at CDC and in collaboration with NIH and other, other HHS partners. But you see that we've made progress. Um, where we have areas to work on, we're clearly working on those. The, the one, the MICH 23, reduced the proportion of breastfed moms who received formula supplementation within the first two days. So that one we haven't met yet. But the target's 14.2. We're at 15.5% now, and we started at 24%. So you don't see the baselines on this slide, but to start at 24% and to be down to 15, we're making a lot of progress. So we're excited about that. So we've come a long way. We're all probably tired. A couple people have mentioned how hard the context of the world is right now. And I think it's important that we don't get too worn out and that we support each other. But Part of that is reflecting on how we achieved the momentum that we've, that we've actually been able to achieve. And remember to sort of pat ourselves on the back for it a little bit, because we do forget that a lot of times. So what have we done at CDC with our partners? And what are we trying to remind ourselves that we are making the world a better place? These are some of our breastfeeding resources that we've made available. And I'm very excited about the first one here, the CDC Guide to Strategies to Support Breastfeeding Mothers and Babies. One of the reasons that this is so important for us is that this is what we ask local and state public health to work on with us. So 
communities, local public health, state public health, if they get money from our division, they're supposed to be working on strategies to promote breastfeeding in the hospital, in the community, in their grandmother's kitchen, wherever they can do it. And this document actually helps them with a menu of opportunities so that they can select things that make the most sense in their context. We were very fortunate in 2011 to have a Surgeon General call to action to support breastfeeding. So I know many of you probably worked on it and you certainly have seen it, but these are specific steps that a whole community can take to promote breastfeeding and promote the services that a woman might need to reach her breastfeeding goals. The third item up here is a vital sign. How many of you have seen a vital sign ever come out of CDC? So these are, um, actually Tom Frieden really pushed these. These are really strong bursts of information that is a priority area from CDC that from our end takes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours and by the time it gets out in the public, it looks like it was so easy to write. And you know you've done a good product when it's like that. And so one, we're really excited. We've had two recent vital signs about um, hospital practices to support breastfeeding, not only with the data, but then also with how hospitals might improve. The fourth document up there, for those of you that can read that, how to keep your breast pump kit clean, was developed in partnership at CDC with a lot of our food safety and environmental health folks because there was a huge need for dispelling fears and rumors that were growing around how terrifying, pe terrified people were recently about cleaning their breast pump. So we're excited about this document that it came out. It, it did receive a lot of personal um, comments on the website for us, so we think it filled a gap that it was intended to fill. So other things we've done, and you, you'll hear me say this again and again, and you all know this, but we continue to support the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. And I hope all of you know about the MPINC survey, so our Maternity Practice and Infant Nutrition and Care Survey, where we look at national and state data around how hospital settings and birth facilities are progressing on meeting baby-friendly criterion designation. The great thing about this, the audience for this is really wide. Um, people really hate to not be the best at something. So what's great about the MPINC scores is when they come out as hospitals can see the other hospital MPINC scores, and then they call us and they wonder why they weren't rated the highest. So competition sometimes is a really, really good thing. And we, um, we do put this report card out intentionally so that people can continue to improve the quality where they are. The last document is, it, that I'll show here is an example of a concerted effort we've made in the division over the last few years to show the value of what we have for not only states, communities, and our partners, but just for the general population. So this was what, what we refer to as an infographic, and we send this out to promote the areas that we think are the highest priority for us. And we had four over the last two years, and breastfeeding was one of them. So this gets a lot of attention not only from our partners, but it gets a lot of attention from people on the Hill, and they are really interested to then invite us to give them more information, which is a critical way for us to show the value for the process of breastfeeding support. So CDC, I don't think very many people know how we work or how we operate. I was a state chronic disease director for eight years before I came to CDC, so I knew the part of CDC that handed out money to states. So that's a lot of what we do. So we get congressional line items with intent, with purposes that say, please send this money to states and have them work on nutrition and physical activity, or please send this money to counties that have really high obesity and have them work on that, or please send this money to land-grant universities and have them work. It's very, very prescriptive. Where we have the most flexibility is some of what I refer to as base appropriations, and with base appropriations, we were able to send out money to state health departments to work on promoting breastfeeding in this last round of funding that, has now, that is now ending. But it was five years of funding, it was competitive, breastfeeding was an option, and we were able to put money into 32 states for them to work on promotion of breastfeeding. So this is about systems and environmental change. And it's interesting, I have just three of, of the success stories from the states that are up there, and there's zillions of success stories on our website, so I won't go through these, but Every state had the opportunity to tailor their context, again, using our list of strategies, to see where they could have the most opportunity. 
and different states chose different things, which is the beautiful thing about having money that comes from base appropriations is we can allow people to have more flexibility with what they need to get done. So some, for instance, some individuals looked at workplace settings, and then some individuals looked at how they might change training around breastfeeding, and how they might support or add lactation consultants into team-based care. So there's, there's very different, different approaches to that. We also worked um, with ASTO and gave them some funding to help us with state initiatives in states that were not funded through that funding stream. So again, we didn't have enough money to fund everybody, not everybody took breastfeeding. So what ASTO did is they actually worked with 18 additional states and also with DC who were not funded in our other funding line to figure out how these program objectives could be met. So increased practices supportive of breastfeeding improve access to professional and peer support for breastfeeding and there's a big mountain to climb and ensure workplace compliance with the federal lactation accommodation laws so again that's a really interesting niche that asto played for us because these were states that maybe weren't the first ones out of the gate in the highest capacity level so they were they were um, needing a, some more technical assistance the other thing that ASTO did was they funded six states to look at innovation around these areas. So what were some innovative strategies that people were using to do these three objectives? So I've got some great stories about some of the, again, some of the states, and I won't go through very many of these, but what you see in Vermont, they, Vermont had a very high capacity employer um, work site wellness support breastfeeding project. And, and they actually worked with some more of these dollars from ASTO to expand that. So stories like that, trainings, I could go on and on. I can take questions about specific projects if we want to at the end. So everybody's mentioned the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, and I'm glad of that. And CDC really uses that as the core mission in so much of the work we do with hospitals. So this is an evidence-based strategy to promote and support breastfeeding that everybody knows about in the room. And it's where women really need the support. After you have that baby and you're wondering what in the heck you do next, it's really important that the maternity care practice system surrounding you supports breastfeeding if that's what your choice is. So we know that those first few hours really support um, the mother's likelihood to breastfeed. And we know that baby-friendly designation helps ensure that maternity care practices provide that support. And what is pretty cool, we, sometimes we forget to look globally um, when we're thinking about baby-friendly, but 170 countries have baby-friendly facilities, and that's more than 20,000 facilities worldwide. So historically, again, over the last 10 years, we had an exciting initiative that many of you know, knew about or know about, the Best Fed Beginnings. This was in collaboration with NICHQ, and really it was about taking breastfeeding rates up by working with hospitals to improve their maternity care practices. So in this project, they selected 89 hospitals and they said, we're gonna work with you to make sure that you get baby-friendly designation. And what's really exciting about the success of this program is that 80% of those hospitals were designated, and at that time, it doubled the number of practices in the United States that were baby-friendly. So that was a huge push, a huge nudge towards changing the culture. And we saw in those hospitals that received that designation that breastfeeding rates went up by 22%. So the bottom line here is that this worked. This is a QI process that, that really worked with the hospitals closely and when we saw improvements from it. So we were so excited about that, we thought we'd change the name and just keep doing it, which is what you do sometimes. Um, Empower Breastfeeding ran from 2014 until now. And what's interesting about this, again, that uses that QI process, that quality improvement process, but it's more specific about what that actual hospital needs. We are pleased that we already have 48 baby-friendly hospitals designated from this program. It continues to evolve, so we will have uh, more hospitals that come into this into 2018. Now, NACHO is a key partner for us at the ground level. NACHO works with the more local state health departments. 
local health departments. So what we do is provide funding to NHA to really address this disparity issue. And how do we promote breastfeeding at the community level with practice and systems change? So what's interesting about this is NACHO, because of how they're connected at the ground level, understand that really breastfeeding is a huge issue in our African-American populations and our underserved communities. So what they did is they selected 69 organizations across the country to work with them specifically on how to reduce these breastfeeding disparities. And we've had nearly 100,000 one-on-one encounters with pregnant and postpartum women in this. And you see over 3,000 breastfeeding support groups 830 community partnerships were established or enhanced, and 150 lactation support providers were trained. Those sound like huge numbers, and you're like, really, she's giving me numbers, this is like so boring. I mean, what you don't understand unless you see it is actually the huge impact that has for these women that live in these communities. So yeah, that's a lot of numbers, but this is really making a difference in women finding the, the in meeting their needs for breastfeeding in their community with people they trust, and also having these partnerships in the communities that can advocate for changes at the community level. So we have a new initiative, Empowered Training, that will run from 2017 to 2019. It doesn't say on the slide, but there's a, there's a special focus on this around safety, infant safety, and also on health equity. So this is a facility-specific training for physicians who, are, who need or to want to implement the maternity practices supportive of breastfeeding. And what's interesting about this is it's a pairing of coaching. So you have breastfeeding experts paired with providers. So sometimes it's the, the physician and sometimes it's the staff and sometimes it's both and sometimes it's the office manager. But it's really the people who need to have access to these breastfeeding experts to overcome the barriers to implementation. So it's very hands-on. We're very excited about this project, and we, so, so we currently have 90 hospitals enrolled, and work will start this summer on that. Now, you've seen this picture before in Karen's slide, but I really want to bring out um, how strong the partnership is, and Karen mentioned it, but, but this partnership between American Academy of Pediatrics and CDC is, is, is like the all the hidden things behind the curtain that you don't actually know and when you start learning how much we do together it's it's really phenomenal so the staff interact at many levels the input we get from the provider surveys that they do helps us do something that's not so goofy um, the things that we learn about from our state health departments goes back to them it's just a nice collaboration and we're very appreciative to have this opportunity to have a new training and you see that we're driving towards this action plan but we can't really do an action plan until we figure out if there's a case for this. So as Karen mentioned, they'll be doing surveys on where the gaps are, and then we'll be working on resources for development and then disseminating those resources. So we've made great strides in the last decade, and we should all take a brief moment to tell ourselves how great we all are, but then we should get busy again, and we need to continue to focus our momentum over the next 10 years. So I show you this slide because this is one of the, th speaking of health equity, one of the things that we really take seriously at CDC and we will focus in on this with our next round of grantees. The lighter the color, it means the less likely that infant is to be breastfed at six months. So the southeast pops up, obviously, as one of our troubled areas. And we take this seriously and want to do what we can do in a culturally sensitive way to figure out how to make sure that we have more infants breastfed, especially in those high need areas. We have other data, and, and again, you guys have seen this data today in other people's slides, but, but the dis disparities that remain for black infants and the breastfeeding initiation rates are just appalling. So what can we do to improve this? And we've identified this as a problem for decades. So what do we need to do to be different? And I don't know how many of you know Heidi Blank, Captain Heidi Blank, who is the Obesity Prevention and Control Branch Chief in our division. And Heidi came in my office the other day and she said, if we don't do something differently, we're never going to change anything. And it's funny how many times that's crossed my head the last couple days. I was with the food industry yesterday and we were talking about changing nutrition um, 
around the country and American Heart Association had pulled this all together. And I felt the same way at that meeting. If we don't do something differently, we're all going to be not advancing what we want to advance. And this is one of the things that we're hoping in our next round of funding that we can help address. The other problems we have, and again, you guys know all this, younger women are less likely to breastfeed than um, moms over the age of 30. And what's been drawn the attention of Congress recently and from the Department of Defense is the disparities in the rural areas. And we know that in the rural areas that infants are less likely to be breastfed than in the urban areas. One of the reasons this is drawn the attention of Department of Defense and Congress is that many of the reserve um, opportunities, the individuals who might serve in the reserves and the individuals who might actually want to be in the military come from our rural areas right now, and the obesity rates prevent them oftentimes from being able to be eligible to apply for the military. And if they're in the reserves, oftentimes it means they are not able to deploy. And so I keep bringing up breastfeeding in these meetings and people look at me like I have lost my mind because it is one of the key determinants that will lead people to be obese and yet it's the context that a lot of people have when they think about deployment or being active in the military is, you know, in that 18-year-old to 21-year-old age group. And they have a, a harder time thinking about the things that we do now influence that generation in 18 years. So those are always pretty funny stares that I get when I start bringing it up. But the warning to all of us is that we have 60% of our moms who stop breastfeeding before they plan to. And at many folks have mentioned today a lot of the reasons for that. And, and we could all mention things all day long, and we would never come up with all the reasons for women at an individual level about what makes it so hard for them. And this is what, what we depend on at CDC. We depend on our grantees to keep us honest and remind us of these barriers, because if we don't stay in touch with that, we come up with some goofy ideas. Um, we have a lot of women who have to go back to work after two days after having a baby. And, you know, I had four weeks off, and that was, I remember sobbing all the way to work after four weeks that this was the worst thing that could happen to me. And my baby was at home with my husband, who's a family physician. So, you know, think about if I left my baby at somebody's house who I didn't even really like. So this is just... This is so sad that you have women after two days, if they don't come back to work, they're going to lose their job. And it's all over the country. So we have to work on that. So a constant theme of what I try to keep in my mind front and center is that moms need to be informed about the challenges of breastfeeding and how to overcome them. And a website is not always the answer, but a website actually is a pretty nice place to start sometimes. So I am pleased that we've had increased traffic to our website, what, and here it is, what to expect when breastfeeding, and the cleaning the breast pump module that we came up with went on this website, and, and traffic went way up because it was a gap that we identified that people didn't know about, and when the word started to get out that that was on there, people started going to learn about that. And while they were there, oh, by the way, they saw these other interesting things. And I've, I've mentioned the infant and toddler website that we've started in the last few weeks, um, again, in my question. But it all ties together. Like, people want to be good parents. They want to be good moms. They want their kids to be healthy. And we talked about what does healthy mean with the food industry yesterday. I, I think about healthy differently than someone in the food industry thinks about healthy. And the food industry people who are making the formula and the toddler milk that Lucy mentioned were all sitting in the room with us yesterday. Healthy for them means people are not hungry and they have a sense of well-being. So healthy for me means you're not going to end up too obese or with diabetes or with heart disease, and that's a different time frame. So I'm all for well-being and not being hungry either, but it is interesting how we have to communicate this in different ways to moms. And I hope Lucy gets a chance to talk about her work where she's helping us with that website. So we need to support moms. We need to support them when they're having their child. We need to have the facility where they deliver support them. We need to get to them before they deliver. And I remember Dr. Haywood Brown last year at this conference 
and Haywood Brown was going to change the world and he was going to make sure that every patient had to come right back in after they went home for delivery to talk to him about their breastfeeding because he was single-handedly going to change this and make them all breastfeed. And I have to say that Haywood Brown has been a true advocate for CDC this year and he has been on the phone with us and he has helped us address problems that have really, really made an impact and he's not taking any credit for it. So I just applaud this summit for a lot of the things that come from it because you do connect us all to people that make a difference that we would never meet otherwise. So thank you for that. Um, and Haywood, I think Lucy had to help one time with Haywood on a phone call because it was like, Lucy, I can't get him to answer me. Why don't you try him? So then she got right to him. It was great. It was perfect. But, but all of that to say is that breastfeeding support can't just start at the hospital. It has to start before the woman comes to the hospital. Community support and more progress in advancing breastfeeding as a social norm. So I hope the folks can, from Rose can talk a little bit about their work too um, over the course. Maybe you can ask me a question where you get to do the first part where you talk about how great you are. But, but I do think that, that that kind of work and the work that Nature and ASTO are doing for us and the work that our grantees are doing is they are making it a social norm and they are changing it so that if people do have cultural if your grandmother didn't breastfeed and they don't think you should breastfeed, you've got to find a lot of other people in your community that can support you if you want that to happen. And you guys all know that. But we are working with our grantees to help them figure that out as well. And if they have stumbling blocks that they figure out who to have, come talk to them. Um, the workplace is a really interesting, um, it, it's, it's a very hard system to get into. We've got our large employers who have lots of money, and this makes a lot of sense to them. And then we have our smaller employers who don't have a lot of money and they read the legislation and the regulations about how it can't be a bathroom and they wonder, well, what, what's it supposed to be then? And somebody mentioned today earlier we send out regulations, but then we send out ideas for regulations, but then we don't have the process behind it. So it is interesting at the community level, again, with the REACH grantees, the racial and ethnic approaches to community health, how some people in these communities solve this problem for small employers. And think nothing of it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Send me that story. I want to shout that from the rooftop in Washington, D.C. So the last one is really education and resources so moms can breastfeed for as long as they choose. This sounds so simple and it's so difficult. And I think about even personally how hard it was for me to do this. But And a lot of women have mentioned that today from the podium. And I remember Karen Pence mentioned this last year from the podium. Um, so that was interesting just how we all personally have these stories as well, as well. So in conclusion, what you see at the bottom, the bottom little stack here, our funding that, we've, that we're ending with states now because it's time for it to end, our baby-friendly hospital work, our best fed beginning history, our empower work that we're doing is all really a core over the last 10 years that has really carried CDC's work forward. And, and has made a difference in this area. You see the next level, and I don't have all our partners listed, I just have a few of them, but you see some of these key things we're doing with AAP and with ASTO and with NACHO, and there's many other groups in the room, and Rose certainly has helped us tremendously, and many other folks have as well. But we, we don't do this just with our grantees, we do this with our partners. The top box is what our new funding announcement that is coming out is called, and the numbers are just, just I mean, 18 is just it's 2018, and we were the seventh thing through the pipeline at CDC. It's not a secret 1807, doesn't really mean anything else. But we'll stop calling it state physical activity and nutrition program within a nanosecond, and I'll walk around for the next five years and talk about 1807. So I just put it up there so people can, can see what it is. But again, we also have the reach, the racial and ethnic approaches to community health, and we will have a number of grantees to get funded at the community level. All of the grants that we have out this year, including our high obesity program that goes to land-grant universities, it all has breastfeeding as a strategy. So we're looking forward to continuing this work and advancing with all of the partners how much we can help communities and states and local areas and families and moms and providers and hospitals and your grandmother and everybody else and your best friend who calls you at 3 in the morning and says, you said this was going to be easy and I hate you because of that. So thank you to everybody for all that you do. And I really want to have questions from folks as is appropriate if we have time. Do we still have time? Okay. Um, any questions you have, I'm sure I can answer everything according to anyone at CDC and give you just the right answer. But really would love to hear from folks. Hi. 
Hi. How are you? Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I'm Christina with the Live and Thrive, and I'm going to speak in a minute. But um, I have a question, which maybe is a little bit of the million dollar question, but about the sustainability of some of this, especially when we're looking at the BFHI, because one of the problems that we have when we work globally promoting BFHI, training BFHI, is recertification. We don't have the funds for um, recertification, and the governments aren't going to take it over. And so how is this working domestically to ensure that the hospitals maintain their BFHI certification and are still doing all of the things that they need to be doing to be breastfeeding friendly? Great question, and it's the thing we should all ask ourselves first about sustainability. So California is the answer. So what California has done is they've legislated that all their hospitals need to have the standards built into their practice, and they've required it. So as states see the return on investment and, and the appeal from their customers that this is something that they like, they take it upon themselves to implement that. Now, will every state be like California? No. But I do think the Hospital Association and many key partners will start to hold people to that level without it being something that has to go back through the same certification. So what we'll see in California is those hospitals will stop seeking certification. And that, but they'll keep doing the maternity practices and set that up into their quality improvement systems that they all do anyway because they're part of a larger animal of a healthcare system that wants the outcomes to be um, as positive as possible. But good question. Hey, so first, congratulations on all of this incredible work in really setting it up for women to be successful, which I think is so critical. Um, I, I had a question about the pump washing instructions, mm -hmm. which in I don't know how many years of pumping for my three kids while a resident, there was no way humanly possible I could comply with what's there. Right. Um, and I was just wondering about the balance between best case that there will be not a gram of bacteria anywhere near the milk and reality. And, and whether we might be actually discouraging women from expressing milk at work because they can't do that and they think, well, formula might be safer. And how do you walk that line? Yeah, so it, it was very political. It was much more political than I thought it would be. And we walked the line by talking people off of that edge where basically you had to change and shower and do the white suit and get the gloves on and, <laughs> you know, heat your water up to 50,000 degrees. So that's kind of where the people who set the guidelines were at CDC, and we were over here sort of where you are, like, are you kidding me? So we did meet a little bit in the middle. And I think what happened is we were able to change their website as well, so they adopted some of our language, because what you were seeing were two parallel suggestions coming from CDC. I know that surprises everyone. But, but we were able to tamper that, because our point in truly advocating with the people who are infectious disease control and don't want women to be sick or babies to be sick was we also have to make it realistic. And do, do we know if there's any follow-up on how, I know you said you're getting lots of downloads, but I'm just thinking, I see a lot of moms with OCD, anxiety disorder, and lactastrophe, yes. and I can imagine that if they saw those guidelines, they would just lose their minds. And I just didn't know if you've been looking at whether there's premature yeah. weaning due to inability to comply with CDC guidance on pump cleaning. I think that the people who are accessing our website are the people that were already completely terrified okay. and making decisions not to breastfeed. So we're, we're at a top echelon, I think, of worriers, and you're commenting that you have other worriers in your patient population, but I don't know that they spend 20 hours a day on the websites, which is what the okay. first round of people were doing, and pulling out specific words and sending them to us and saying, is this really true? But it's an interesting area it, for research, because I don't think we know, it's I mean, people do all sorts of things. They put their pump parts in the fridge without washing them, they use yes. the little plastic bag things, and so I see an opportunity for a study, and there's a difference you. between the NICU baby and the yes. toddler. Yeah, get on that, will you? All right. Yeah, good. Do you have a yeah. great, an RFA that I can apply to? <laughs> <laughs> well, Janine already left, so let's have her do it. Uh-huh, yeah. Whoever leaves, we'll tell them to do it. Anybody else? Questions, comments? I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good. I meant right now. No power. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I, I went to a, a session on national initiatives on, on funding, and I, I don't know who was speaking. Um, and at that time, I worked for a small community-based program. Now I work for a small community-based program, but it's another one. Mm -hmm. But anyway, one of the things that came up is they're like, well, we have this money, and we have this money, and we have this money, and it's for the 50 states. And we have this, and we, it's for the 50 states. And, I will, uh, and then I was like, well, what about Puerto Rico? They're like, well, we're only allowed to allocate the money which Congress has authorized yeah. us to allocate. So even though I saw Puerto Rico there in the light green, it wasn't the lightest green, it was only slightly light. Good job. <laughs> um, do you know how, how, how much of an, because right now you all are paying the price of not having invested in Puerto Rico because of all of the formula that you've had to send to Puerto Rico after Maria, so, and not CDC, you right. know, but, but just like, I'm sorry, I'm grouping you with, in with everything it's that's good. federal. It you know, like, ever. Right, yeah. exactly. Uh, but you understand when I, so. I tell you, right, so again, it's congressional intent, and generally when I say 50 states, for us it means 50 states, territories, and tribes. Okay. So, so generally our funding moves to territories and tribes, but generally we don't all say that, but not every CDC line has that, so I have other right. lines that I can't give to But any. there are some funds that are not for, that, that literally Correct. are not for us. Like, no, nope, you don't I, not get that. that I know. Yeah. Not in, again, I can't answer for all of CDC, so not. Okay. Right. And I know the reproductive health folks work with the islands and tribes, and a lot right. of the Zika work was funded by CDC. Right, I went to a Zika, yeah. like, uh, like so session in CDC. Generally, it's tribes, yeah. okay. territories, and states. All right. We just don't usually say it. So I'm surprised somebody said they couldn't fund. Puerto literally, Rico. it was some money that wasn't, that was, yeah. But, weird. Anyway, but weird. anyway, so and may, so maybe it's a language thing for me. Maybe I'm always going to be like ultra. Set. I saw the the continental U.S. I didn't even see Hawaii or Florida. Right. Yeah. But okay. All right. Yep. Great. Thank you, everybody.